Look, if you struggle with autoimmune disease, we're gonna be talking in depth. This is part one of a three-part series of why the current system has failed you and what you need to know to dig your health out of it. Stay tuned. You unlock this door with the key of compassion. Beyond it is another world, a world of science, a world of common sense, a world of sanity. You're moving into a land of both empathy and ethics, of nutritional knowledge and empowerment. You've just crossed over into Dr. Osborne's zone. Welcome to Dr. Osborne's zone. Now I've been spending a lot of time talking about health advice gone wrong, bad public health policy, and other topics similar to that. And today I wanna to make things very, very coherent for you. Um, so if you are tender of heart, if you are easily offended, go ahead and tune out right now. Um, we're gonna get very, very real over this series. Uh, and if you get offended easily, it's just not the right place for you. Um, number two, if you struggle with autoimmune disease, this is something you're definitely gonna wanna pay a lot of attention to. And I would encourage you right now to pause it, get up, maybe go get a pen and a piece of paper or a notebook. You're gonna wanna take copious notes. What I'm trying to do is basically arm you with the information that can help you overcome any form of autoimmunity or chronic degenerative issue that you're struggling with. And a lot of what I'm gonna say is the exact opposite of what you've heard. Uh, and so again, if you're offended easy, if you don't have tough skin, uh, if you can't be open to admitting that you've been doing things wrong and you wanna open yourself up to a new way of doing it, this is not the right channel for you. So all that being said, Let's dive in to tonight's show. Now, I was invited a couple years ago to um, a hospital system. You see on my coffee mug here, um, Torrance Memorial invited me out to perform this very conversation that I'm gonna be having with you. So I've never done this uh, in this format, you know, for the general public. You know, I've talked to many doctors about this, and so this is a culmination of years and years of research and clinical experience. So I hope you garner ex uh, expansive value from it, and I hope it's life-changing for you should you apply it. So without further ado, let's dive into the conversation. So let's start with autoimmunity. So many of you, I know that watch my show, subscribe to my channel, a lot of you struggle um, with autoimmune problems. And, you know, there are a variety uh, of different types of autoimmune processes. As a matter of fact, you know, some researchers, you know, have calculated somewhere in the neighborhood of 100 to 140 different forms of autoimmunity. So for the last several years, we've been fighting the wrong war, um, the wrong pandemic, if you will. The true pandemic in this country is autoimmune disease, you know, with you know, researchers estimating between, you know, 100, 140 different types of autoimmune disease. Um, this is the major battlefront that we need to plant our flag in the ground because this is what is killing people. Um, people are not dying from some, I'm not saying people can't die from infectious disease, but the real reason their bodies are so weak they can't handle an infectious disease is because of autoimmunity. Their bodies are so distraught by trying to figure out um, the immune system so distraught by trying to figure out what to do and how to behave, it, it can't do its great function and its great work because it's so distracted by other things. And that's what we're really gonna be diving into is the real pandemic, which is autoimmune disease. Number one cause of death, um, if we add up all autoimmune diseases and we include certain types of heart disease uh, and other common neurological diseases and even certain cancers as in-stage autoimmune diseases, um, then autoimmunity trumps any other cause of death. And so, again, the real pandemic, autoimmunity. So let's, let's answer some questions. So on the board here, um, this is according to the American Academy of Allergy, of Allergy and uh, Asthma and Immunology. An autoimmune disease is an illness that causes the immune system to produce antibodies that attack normal body tissues. Autoimmune is when your body attacks itself, it sees a part of your body or a process as a disease and tries to combat it. And if we look at some of the statistics, and this is um, from the American Autoimmune Related Disorders Association, uh, an estimated 50 million Americans suffer with autoimmunity. Now, if we compare that to cancer and heart disease, you know, nine million have cancer, 22 million have heart disease. So autoimmunity, 
almost doubles the, the quantitatively the, um, the amount of people who are afflicted over cancer and heart disease combined, right? So very important. Autoimmune disease is the number one cause of death. Some argue this, no, it's a top 10 cause of death, but some argue it's as high as the number one cause of death in women under the age of 65. Um, there are more than 100 forms of autoimmune disease currently recognized by research. Symptoms cross many specialties and can, and can affect all body organs, so it's not limited to one area. Medical education provides minimal learning about autoimmune disease. Specialists are generally unaware of interrelationships among the different forms of autoimmune diseases. And initial symptoms are often intermittent and unspecific until the disease becomes acute. Um, and then we also have the fact that research is generally disease specific and limited in scope. More information sharing and crossover among research projects on different autoimmune diseases is needed. You know, think about that for a minute. You know, we have autoimmune disease representing more than 100 forms of disease. Now, heart disease, you know, we clump together. We clump all the different forms of heart disease, you know, whether it's placking or whether it's hypertension or high cholesterol or atherosclerosis or stroke. Um, those are all classified under heart disease, right? And then we look at cancer much in the same way. All forms of cancer are clumped together and called cancer um, as a whole. With autoimmune disease, we don't do that. And this is one of the big problems is that we separate autoimmunity out into a hundred seemingly, um, you say, not very common disorders, but when you add them together, they, again, they almost double cancer and heart disease combined. So autoimmune disease is why I say it's the plague of our modern society. It's the, it's the true pandemic that we're struggling with. Now, some examples we'll put on the board for you. So Hashimoto's, uh, any of you been diagnosed with hypothyroidism, rheumatoid arthritis, celiac disease, ulcerative colitis, type one diabetes, asthma, Sjogren's, lupus, then the list goes on. I'm not going to read the whole list to you, but um, you know you can screenshot this and um, and get a good idea of some of the more common forms or pervasive forms of autoimmune disease. Now, many of you have probably been told this about your autoimmune condition. I, I hear this all the time from the people that come to see me: is that the doctors tell the patients, "We don't know why you have this autoimmune disease. We don't know what causes it." Um, but there's, and in, in that same breath, right, we don't know what causes it, but you, we know you need this medication to control it. Now, first of all, that makes no sense. If you don't know what causes it, how do you know that the medicine is the right move, right? It, it seems to me like we would want to know why the disease is caused so that we could be empowered to take meaningful change and action upon the, those causes. But, you know, most doctors will completely dismiss the idea that there is a cause for autoimmune disease, I think we, we could say except for one type, and that would be celiac disease. Many doctors do believe that celiac disease is caused by a food protein known as gluten, gluten sensitivity, if you will. And, um, and, and so why wouldn't we take the same, at least generalized approach toward other forms of autoimmunity? This was the, this was the conundrum when I was in graduate school and, and working in the VA hospital. This was the conundrum that I always would run up against was if, if we know what causes celiac disease, why wouldn't we at least explore the possibility that what causes one autoimmune disease might also be what can trigger other forms of autoimmunity? And I hit massive roadblocks uh, in the rheumatology department, again, at the VA hospital where I, where I interned for some time. Now, um, you'll also hear this from your doctors. Food has nothing to do with autoimmunity, even though the only example of known autoimmunity, known cause autoimmunity, is caused by food, right? Um, there's no such thing as leaky gut, which is a major, major part of how autoimmune disease develops. And if you look up leaky gut, um, which is a layman's term, you'll find all kinds of information. Uh, if you look up the term intestinal hyperpermeability, which is the medical um, terminology, if you will, or vernacular for saying leaky gut, You'll find thousands of research studies that confirm that leaky gut exists and that leaky gut is a precursor to autoimmune disease. But still today, even, even now, many doctors dismiss it as if it's, uh, as if it's a non-entity. Um, you'll also hear that chemicals and pesticides used in food production are safe and are not contributing factors at all to autoimmunity. You'll hear sometimes from the doctors that sunshine is dangerous um, and that, you know, 
it will burn your skin and cause cancer. You should avoid sunshine, even though it's you know the best way to get vitamin D, which is a major, major reason. Deficiency of vitamin D is a major reason why people develop autoimmunity. And then you'll also hear that not getting vaccinated is dangerous uh, and irresponsible. And, and so these are, these are kind of what we would call medical truths of sorts, because this is, the, this is the line that most people have been diagnosed with an autoimmune disease have been given. Now, if we look at the current medical system, it's diagnostic centric. That means um, patient comes in, list of symptoms, doctor will listen to the symptoms, sometimes run a few lab tests, and then they'll give your symptoms or your cluster a name, right? So if you come in, for example, with morning stiffness and swelling in your joints uh, and pain in your joints, um, doctor runs a blood test, finds something like rheumatoid factor, he, the name he's going to give that disease most likely is rheumatoid arthritis, right? You come in, you're tired all the time, you're losing hair, uh, maybe you have a goiter in your neck, the doctor runs a thyroid panel, and, you know, they may call it Hashimoto's, right? So this is, again, it's diagnostic-centric, meaning give your symptoms or your cluster problems a name, a diagnosis, if you will. Now, once you have the diagnosis, then now the doctor will go into treatment mode, which is we know what to call what you have, and here's the drug to treat it. Never mind what caused it, never mind what triggered it, never mind what you may have been doing um, to cause this illness to, to come out in your body. Um, we're, we're going to victimize you by giving it a name, right? How many times have you heard a person say, my diabetes, right, or my cancer? They own it. They, they move in. They take ownership over the, the disease. And, and, you know, it's important that people have closure and they, they, they get a name. But understand that you should separate yourself and your actions from the name of the illness that your doctor's diagnosing because if you don't, you'll always be a victim. You'll, you'll never actually come around to empowering yourself to be able to actually overcome the autoimmune disease, which by the way is another thing that doctors will commonly tell you about autoimmunity, which is there is no treatment outside of symptomatic reduction and there is no cure, which is wrong. Um, I've seen thousands of cases of autoimmune disease go on remission with simple diet and lifestyle changes, and yours is not any different. Your autoimmune disease is not any different. Now, um, Lifelong disease management. There are no cures. Again, this is, this is the hallmark of what you're going to hear, again, traditional mainstay medicine. So if, you're, if you've heard these things, uh, you, they're probably resonating with you right now if you're frustrated and you're watching my channel. You, you didn't come here first. You probably came here after being frustrated looking for answers, um, as, as many people do. Um, so so you, you probably recognize or have heard a lot of these different things. As a matter of fact, let's just pull you. How many of you type down below in the chat box, how many of you have been told any of these things, you know, with your autoimmune diagnosis? And uh, how many of you have asked about diet and lifestyle change and whether or not that played a role and were told, no, it absolutely played no role. I'd just love to hear from you. So comment below. Now, if we look at autoimmunity, we know the problem's not going away. So again, it's, it's getting worse. When we look historically at, at the rise of autoimmune disease, I'll show you this image here. Um, this is published in New England Journal. And this, this is almost a 20-year-old image. The problem's actually much worse today, but you can see the rising incidence of autoimmune disease get, you know, starting in 1950. If you follow the trajectory up to 2000, you can see an exponential climb. These are percent increases of autoimmune disease. So for example, you can see a more than a 300% increase in multiple sclerosis, almost a 400% increase in Crohn's disease, almost a 300% increase in type 1 diabetes, a 300% increase in, in asthma, which is, you know, a lot of people don't realize is an autoimmune disease. They just think, give me the steroid and, and uh, I'll control my asthma with it. But, and these are just a few examples of autoimmunity. Like we see the rise of Hashimoto's, we see the increased incidence of celiac disease, we're seeing the increased re incidence of, of, um, of many forms of autoimmunity, not just these four. Now, science has a recognized central mechanism of autoimmune disease that very few people are ever taught about. Um, and this includes your doctors. Um, many doctors, remember I said earlier that there's not really a formal education in autoimmune training in medicine. Um, and, so, and so these centrally recognized mechanisms are written about 
profusely in medical literature and in the research, but are very, very rarely discussed amongst practicing doctors with their patients. And so if you look here again at this slide, you can see these are, in a sense, these are three intertwining cogwheels that trigger autoimmune disease together. The first on the left you can see is molecular mimicry, which we'll get into. Um, the second to the top is too much hygiene, hy hyper hygiene, being too clean. Now, now, many of you may be germaphobes, especially after the last three years where we were told to, you know, not touch anything and put up acrylic plastic, uh, uh, you know, so that humans can't have any contact and wear masks, right? That too much hygiene um, actually can induce disease, and we'll, we'll get into that as well. And then intestinal permeability, hyperpermeability, or leaky gut, which I mentioned earlier, these are all mechanisms that researchers recognize are central to the creation of autoimmune disease. Now, if we look at what leaky gut is, um, it's, it's technically leaky gut is pre-autoimmunity, meaning it's, it's one of the precursors that has to be true for many forms of disease to begin to develop. And so um, one of the things that's important to understand is 70 to 80% of your entire immune system is in your intestinal tract. It's, it's actually got a name, it's called the GALT, G-A-L-T, that stands for gastro-associated lymphoid tissue. So if you look at this diagram, you can see at the top in step one, there's certain environmental triggers that, that come in, and many of these triggers come in through the gut. They're, these triggers are what we eat in a large sense, and so this is one of the reasons why celiac, you know, caused by gluten, um, gluten is something we ingest, it's something that we eat, but we can eat other foods. Other food proteins, other food uh, ingredients can also be environmental triggers toward the development uh, of autoimmunity and food additives and food preservatives and other things you put in your mouth, um, uh, medications as well, we'll get into a lot of that. So environmental triggers, what happens is the more environmental triggers you subject your body to, the more your immune system has to work to try to neutralize those triggers. And that's step two in this diagram, overburdened immune system. And an overburdened immune system will then start to recognize you and your own cells as potential bad guys. This is where molecular mimicry comes in. Some of the chemicals that are in our food, some of the processed items in our food, have what's called molecular mimicry with our own tissue, meaning some of the things that we eat look like our joints or look like our thyroid or look like our skin. And so if our immune system perceives those things to be enemies and then starts to attack them, it will then start to look at our own tissue also as a potential enemy and attack it. And this is why autoimmune disease, um, one of the reasons why it develops. And then once you have a chronic immune system that's attacking you, that leads to an inflammatory response, so inflammation, right? We always hear how bad inflammation is, but nobody really ever talks about what causes inflammation, right? Doctors, when they say, we, we need to stop the inflammation, and we wanna block your immune system's ability to produce chemicals of inflammation, or we wanna give you a medicine that blocks or that hinders or inhibits the way your body produces inflammation. Remember this, keynote, write this down. Inflammation is not the bad guy, chronic, overabundance of inflammation is. We, our body uses inflammation to break down old cells so that we can repair and rebuild new cells to take their place. So think of inflammation almost like the housekeeper of the body. It comes in, uh, it takes away old debris so that we can make room and, and build new cells to take over and do the job uh, that the old cells could no longer do. So inflammation is a part of our own internal housekeeping. But when the inflammation is aggressively high over long periods of time, what that indicates is the body is breaking down faster than it's capable of repairing. Sometimes we refer to this as a repair deficit, meaning again, you break down faster than you're able to rebuild, and this is when your tissues start to fail. Your organs can start to fail. Your function will start to fail. And that tissue damage is where the early symptoms can start to set in, the pain, the swelling, the fatigue, these are the general symptoms typically not diagnosed early on. When somebody goes to the doctor and they're like, I'm just more tired, my memory's not as good, my hair's not growing as thick, I'm bruising more easily. These are esoteric kind of diffuse symptoms that don't have um, any definitive, doctors don't have any definitive way of, of trying to isolate why those symptoms exist. And so a lot of times they just get dismissed or they get medicated, right? Well, let's, if you're tired, let me give you Adderall if you can't focus. If you're, 
you know, if you're inflamed, let me give you a non anti-inflammatory. If, you, if you're having trouble breathing, let me give you a steroid to inhale. And so instead of asking, where does that symptom come from? You know, the answer is typically, well, here's a drug to manipulate how you feel so that we can suppress that symptom. And that's the wrong move. Uh, philosophically, it's, it's a terrible move, and here's why. If you don't know why the symptom exists and you mask it, then you're not fixing the problem. That Your body is going to keep deteriorating at a quicker pace as long as you are doing the things that created the chronic inflammation and tissue damage. Medicine is not going to stop that from happening. It's going to continue to happen. As a matter of fact, most of the time your body finds a workaround. If you're blocking a pathway using a drug, your body's going to find another way to alert you that you need to make a change. And this is one of the reasons why we're in this position today of what's called polypharmacy, where the average American over the age of 40 is on multiple medications. And, uh, and you, know, you know, now you've got, you've got medicines, four, five, six different medications in your medicine cabinet every day, all designed to help suppress your symptoms, but not designed to help you figure out why your symptoms exist. And so if you live in that false sense of security, your body just ages and deteriorates at a much more rapid pace. And, uh, and that's bad. That's a bad thing. So let's look at some of the known causes of leaky gut. If you, again, look on this diagram I've got for you. This is not by any means an all-inclusive list of all the things that can cause leaky gut, but it's some of the more common ones. And so as we follow this around from gluten, uh, we know absolutely causes leaky gut. A great researcher, um, Dr. Alessio Fasano, who's now at Harvard, um, discovered that to be the case a number of years ago. GMO foods, genetically modified organisms, and the pesticides that are sprayed um, on those are known trigger factors for leaky gut. Plastics, the chemicals found in plastics have been shown to cause leaky gut. So, you know, if you're drinking out of those plastic water bottles and heating your food up in plastic Tupperware, eating out of plastic wrapped uh, foods at fast food chains, you're exposing yourself to tremendous quantities of microplastics where you're, you know, you're, again, you're damaging your GI tract over time. Um, I mentioned pesticides, aggressive exercise. I'm not talking about, you know, going to the gym and working out or trying to stay physically fit. I'm talking about overabundance. Uh, I'm talking about some people that aggressively train too hard. This can actually cause leaky gut. Medications. Uh, there's a number of medications that we know can cause it, including your common over-the-counter non anti-inflammatories like aspirin and ibuprofen. We also know that steroids cause leaky gut. We know that antibiotics cause leaky gut. We know that uh, a number of different medicines given for heartburn, antacids can cause leaky gut. So no shortage of, of, of medicines um, that, we, that we see affecting the GI tract. And then infection, there are different types of bacterial overgrowth or fungal overgrowth that can occur, uh, particularly in the, in the GI tract itself. This is especially true, many of those of you who have you know, chronic gas or bloating or intestinal distension or pain when you eat, um, a lot of times that's a sign, an underlying, or an underlying sign of a, of a bacteria or fungal overgrowth in the intestines because those bacteria or fungus can take your carbohydrates and they produce hydrogen and methane gas as a byproduct, and that will cause a lot of the symptoms of what doctors now diagnose as IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. Um, food allergies, food sensitivities, not just gluten. Um, the, you know, soy um, has been shown to cause villus atrophy, just like gluten, corn, uh, and other things. There's also just uniqueness. One man's food is another man's poison. So I, I see people sometimes allergic to broccoli, uh, sometimes allergic to superfoods like blueberries. So food is definitely a, a major trigger or can be. So the reason I share this list with you is we're trying to get to the root of autoimmune disease. And if you want to get to the root, you have to get to what are your triggers. So many people ask me, you know, Dr. Osborne, what can I do, you know, for this autoimmune problem or for that autoimmune problem? And, you know, the simplest answer I can give you is you've got to get to the root of your triggers. And so this comprehensive list here is just trying to help you understand what potential triggers you might have. And, you know, you need to get tested um, beyond that to get very, very specific. And that's when you work with a practitioner who understands proper testing to help you identify what your triggers are. Let's talk a little bit more in depth about leaky gut. So what does leaky gut damage do? Uh, number one, it overstimulates the immune system. 
it can allow bacterial and viral toxins to access your central circulation. Once your gut's leaking, remember your, your GI tract has on an order of magnitude of 10 times more microorganisms than you have human cells in your entire body, right? So you're actually outnumbered 10 to one just by what lives in your GI tract. And so if your gut's leaking, now all those bacteria that produce metabolic byproducts and toxins like lipopolysaccharides, LPS, those things can leak across into your bloodstream and cause damage. And some, some of the major research going on right now is a, a substance called LPS. The, these are toxins produced by bacteria that are they're now showing damage the liver, cause fatty liver disease, slow down the metabolism in the liver. So if you're taking medication, some people become more prone to the side effects of their medicines because their liver's being damaged by that leaky gut and that toxin leakage. Again, so, so we don't want that happening. Ideally, we want that gut sealed. We know that a leaky gut can cause an increased risk for the development of new food allergies. As remember your gut's job, very simply put, it's to separate the things that don't belong in your bloodstream from the things that do. And it's to allow the nutrients, the vitamins, the minerals, the carbs, fats, proteins, etc., into the blood to nourish us so that we can have access to you know, the raw ingredients that are necessary to help us heal and repair and maintain function. And we're supposed to keep the waste and the toxins out. That's why we form stools. That's why we have bowel movements. It's to get rid of those things. So your gut is a highly intelligent, organized and efficient system capable of doing that for you if you take care of it. And so if, if you don't though, and it's open, then now the very foods that you eat, you can actually start to become allergic to over time. And this is why so many people find themselves restricting and restricting and restricting because they're, they're not getting to the origin of their problem. And so their diet just gets more and more narrow as time goes on. The other thing that leaky gut does is it sets the stage for molecular mimicry. So going back to the diagram I showed you earlier, if you recall the, you know, the mechanism, the central mechanisms, one of them was molecular mimicry. Well, when you have leaky gut, now the things in your gut can leak across. If, and, and again, some of those things can mimic your own tissue. So now your immune system starts to turn its sights on those things leaking across. And if they look like your tissue, your body will then subsequently begin to attack itself. And that's, again, that's the molecular mimicry process. Now, oftentimes leaky gut is linked to an abnormal microbiome, meaning not having adequate quantities of healthy bacteria. You know, we, we live in a world where antibiotics are king and used in mass in farming. They're used in our water supply. They're used as pesticides, and they're also used in humans to treat infectious disease. So we're bombarded by antibiotics not just the medication antibiotics, but we're bombarded by biochemicals that behave as antibiotics all the time. Think about all the hygiene products that you use too, the hand sanitizers and the soaps and the detergents, all that's designed to kill the life on your skin and inside of you, that very life that you need in order to be healthy, right? We are not, uh, as humans, we are not alone. We have um, what we would really wanna, wanna call a, a symbiotic relationship with bacteria and fungi that live on us and in us. And, and so when we deplete that, those bacteria that live in our gut, guess what they help us do? Well, they help us digest our food. They help us make B vitamins. They also help us produce vitamin K. They help us to produce a, uh, a mucin, which is a substance that coats and lines the GI tract and prevents it from leaking. They also help our immune system behave. Um, they send messages to our immune system about how to, um, how to view different things in the GI tract. So those bacteria in your gut are so critical. And if you're doing things on a daily basis to destroy them, um, then your health will deteriorate and autoimmune disease is most likely going to be in your future. Um, we also know that leaky gut creates a, a process of damage in the gut that leads to malabsorption of the very vitamins, minerals, and nutrients that we need to heal and repair. So now we get stuck in this vicious trap of nutritional deficiency. And, uh, and, and with that, um, you know, it makes it very, very challenging to heal because you, you, know, you, you can't heal without vitamin C and zinc and vitamin A and vitamin D. And if you're malabsorbing those nutrients or deficient in them, your body will really struggle. 
And then once that gut is breached, once you have a leaky gut, understand you have multiple other barriers beyond your gut. You've got the barrier called the blood-brain barrier. So once the gut barrier is broken down and those toxins leak in, they can now start breaking down your blood-brain barrier. They can break down your kidney barrier, your lung barrier. You have a vascular endothelial lining or the inside lining of your blood vessels. Those are a barrier, right? And so when those things all start breaking down systematically, this is when health deteriorates at a much more rapid pace. And this is one of the reasons why people with autoimmune disease begin collecting them, right? The average person with one over their lifetime, if they don't figure out why they have it, generally will go on to develop about six more. So autoimmune disease, if we look at it, I mean, going backwards, I want you to look at autoimmune disease not as a hundred different types of conditions. I want you to look at autoimmune disease as one problem that has a multitude of triggers and it can change, right? So sometimes people with rheumatoid arthritis will go on to develop psoriatic arthritis or lupus or will go on to develop Hashimoto's. We see this with celiac disease. Celiacs very commonly will develop RA, uh, rheumatoid arthritis. They'll very commonly develop type 1 diabetes or Sjogren's disease. So again, you start collecting them not because they're different diseases. Doctors have classified them as different diseases is to organize their thoughts, but this autoimmune disease isn't really technically hundreds of different diseases, it's a process. And if you understand the process and you understand how to reverse engineer what's triggering the process of autoimmune development, that's where the magic happens. That's where you can empower yourself to get better. So what I said earlier, we have one model of autoimmune disease where the scientific consensus agrees on the cause, and that's celiac disease, gluten. This is when I was in the VA hospital, I was so frustrated because we were treating patients with rheumatoid arthritis and, and lupus and other you know, varying types of, of um, rheumatological disease. And the doctors, um, they, they didn't wanna look at triggers. They just simply wanted to medicate everybody. It was, it was super frustrating because I knew um, intuitively, I knew that you know autoimmune disease has a cause. If if one has a cause, they all have a cause. We just have to look deeper, and and no one would allow me to do that. And um, and that's one of the reasons why I, I when I left, uh, and I was finally able to start looking at triggers. That's one of the reasons why I am where I'm at today. Um, if any of you have ever read you know my book No Gray No Pain, I, I there's a story in that book about a little girl named Ginger. She had a terminal diagnosis. She was nine. And uh, she had been diagnosed with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis at the age of two. And her mother, um, you know, had taken her to a rheumatologist. And for seven years, they medicated this little girl with a, with a drug called methotrexate, among others. Um, methotrexate, very potent anti-cancer drug that destroys the GI tract and inhibits the replication of new cells. So it makes it almost impossible for a person who's taking it to ever really truly fully heal because it, it creates in, inefficiencies in, in the way your body can make new DNA and RNA. And, and this little girl was on that drug for seven years, like her, her, her formative years of development, for, so from two to nine. And then when she turns nine, her condition's not getting any better. It's not really being controlled. And the doctor looks at, at her mom and says, your daughter's gonna die. You need to go home and get your affairs in order. Now imagine being a parent and getting that message. Um, they sent this little, they basically said we can't treat her anymore um, and they gave up on her and gave her six months to live. Uh, travesty. I was, I was blessed to be in her path. Her mom brought her into my office. You know, in her case, she was gluten sensitive and she was reactive to blueberries. And when we changed those things about her diet, she, within six months, she was no longer in pain. She had a permanent port embedded in her arm because she was in and out of the hospital so frequently. So after about six months, we were able to remove that port um, because she didn't need to keep going to the hospital. At that point, she was supposed to have already been dead, but she was still very, very much alive. And then at 12 months, she was in full remission, all because of diet change, all because we took the time to ask the right questions and to reverse engineer the triggers for autoimmune disease. Don't ever forget, there are triggers that can be reverse engineered. So in her case, again, food was her major trigger and the doctors would have none of it. Now, with autoimmune disease, a lot of people are looking for the smoking gun, right? And this is the problem with drug research is 
you know, drug producers are always looking for what mechanism can we block that is the smoking gun to heal uh, the symptoms of this person's disease. And the problem with that is when you start blocking a biological pathway in the human body, the body is so smart, it works around it. Uh, it works its way through it, it overcomes it. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why drugs have limited shelf life of effect. The body's just too smart and it's gonna find a way around it because remember what symptoms are. Symptoms are not what you treat with medicine. Symptoms are your body's way of alerting you to the fact that you're doing something wrong and that you need to make a change. You don't wanna suppress them unless you want to maintain your illness and then add money to your monthly drug budget and then add money beyond that to more drugs coming because you know, once the drugs start kicking in with their side effects, their negative side effects, and your doctors are gonna start medicating those side effects with more medications and then you're gonna be a polypharmacy case and those never really respond well. As a matter of fact, research shows that medicine intentionally prescribed is the third leading cause of death and, uh, and, that, and that's, to me, that, that should be the alarm bell that you're all waking up to because if, 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 if supposedly cancer and heart disease are the top two causes of death and medicine is the way that we treat it and that's the third leading cause of death, we have a hell of a problem uh, in, in, industrialized, in the industrialized world as to, how, um, as to how things are being handled and done. And, and obviously, with that kind of, with that kind of um, outcome, that kind of empirical outcome, um, we, look, we want to look for a different way. So going back to there's no magic bullet, autoimmune disease is multifactorial. What I'm putting up here on the screen for you are some of these multifactorial components. So the first being food and nutrition. You can be allergic to food. You can, um, you can be sensitive to food. You could be not getting enough food, so you're, under, you're malnourished in carbs, fats, or proteins. You're not getting enough calories. You could be getting too many calories. You could be getting too many of the wrong kinds of macronutrients. A perfect example, carbohydrate toxicity is oftentimes diagnosed as diabetes. And, um, and so um, we also know that food provides vitamins and minerals, which are critical to the health and functioning of the human body. So we have to start with food and nutrition as kind of a fundamental place to begin the education process. Um, we know that there are chemicals in food, pesticides, herbicides. We know that uh, food dyes and preservatives and flavoring agents are all added and that these things are not necessarily benign. Now, many of them are on what's called the grass list, the generally recognized as safe food ingredient list. But um, understand that that grass list, many of those compounds that are on it were grandfathered in and never actually studied to be found safe. They were just assumed to be safe. So that's what generally recognized as safe means. They don't, it's like slow poison. It doesn't kill you tomorrow, but you know, multiply it over a 10 year period or span of overdosing exposure, then it definitely has health effects. Now we move into air quality, smoking, indoor air pollutants, outdoor air pollutants, EMF or electromagnetic frequencies, air fresheners. How many of you, um, you know, you get into a cab or you get into an Uber um, or you go to somebody's house and they've got one of those damn Glade plugins, you know, in the wall and, you know, you, you get migraine headaches or you see your nose starts running or you just don't feel well when you're around that. Those things are toxic and, you know, most people are using them um, to mask the bad odors in their home. Uh, and anyway, I'll get off that, but my point being is they're toxic. And you go to shopping somewhere and they pipe these things through the air ducts so that the store smells you know, a certain way. And a lot of these compounds, remember your nose, things you breathe into your body, that, go, that goes straight to your brain it, through your olfactory nerve. And so you don't, you don't want all that chemical nonsense you know, having access to your brain. It's your brain should, you should consider it to be precious, right? Uh, water quality, you know, we got fluoride, chlorine, chloramine medications in the water, to name a few. And then, and then there's also infectious microorganisms or bacterial or fungus or uh, mold yeast, virus, parasitic uh, entities that can, that can colonize our GI tracts or colonize our body and contribute to illness. We're gonna talk in depth about all these things. There's medical interventions, you know, waxings, uh, amalgams, medications, surgical implants, all these things play a role and have an impact. Um, we have the fact that uh, people today don't go outside and there's a lack of sunshine that which can create vitamin D and melatonin deficiency. There's a lack of sleep 
in this country and people being exposed to artificial light sources on a regular basis without being exposed to natural lights. Uh, and caffeine overutilization. Everybody's so tired all the time, they, they pump themselves full of tons of caffeine to get by, or Adderall, one or the other, uh, at least in my experience. And then excessive stress, whether it's relationships or work, or you're trying to find your purpose in the world and struggling in that re regard, or time management, and so you're, you're not good with that and it creates more stress for you, but excessive stress, major, major role. And then we have a lack of physical acumen or lack of physical activity. Um, this is, you know, sedentary lifestyles. Kids go to school. PE has been removed from a lot of schools. Um, you've got you've got a lot of kids that are, are not athletically inclined, not because they couldn't be, but because their parents are worried that they might get hurt. Um, you've got a lot of kids that just are being given so much homework, there's no additional time after academics to, to be able to be physical. And so you know, that sedentary lifestyle transfers into adulthood where people go off to desks and sit in corners and, you know, work at a desk for eight, ten hours a day, you know, without any exercise. Uh, and then there's convenience, right? It's easier to get in your car and drive than it is to walk. So again, that, that lack of physical activity is very, very um, damning to good health. Now, I'm going to pull up another image here for you because I want you to understand the concept. If you understand this concept, you're going to do very, very well trying to navigate how to keep yourself healthy. You see this term phenotypic expression equals you plus your gene interaction. So when you hear a doctor say your phenotype, it's what they're referring to is it's a phenotype is, is a combination of your genes plus your choices, right? So you make choices, those choices interact with your genes, that interaction leads to the manifestation of you right whether you're healthy or whether you're sick so an expression of good health means you're making good choices an expression of bad health means you're making bad choices because genes don't make you sick um, your choices do you're not born with bad genes your genes are a gift from god remember that if any doctor tries to tell you otherwise you should probably look for a new doctor we've we've known this for decades that genes can play a predisposition role but choices play you know, probably greater along the lines of 70 to 80 percent of why people get sick is related to their choices, not their bad genes. So always remember that you have more power and more control with your choices than doom in your genes. So if you look at this diagram here, you can see here there's a chemical, a, a physical, and an emotional, spiritual component to this diagram. It's called the triangle of health. And at the core of the triangle, you have a genetic code. That genetic code, you cannot change what it is, but you can change how it expresses itself. And, and that you change with your choices. For example, if you eat sugar on a daily basis, your genes that code for the production of insulin are going to increase. You're going to make more insulin to compensate for the choice of eating more sugar. You do that long enough, your insulin is, be gonna, is gonna become less and less effective over time. That's what they call insulin resistance. This is what leads to diabetes. It's a choice that people make consistently. It's not one day I ate sugar and develop diabetes tomorrow. These are choices that you make day in and day out that affect the expression of your genetic code. Remember, your genes aren't the enemy. Your genes are trying to keep you alive. And, uh, and, and don't ever forget that. Your genes adapt to your choices to keep you alive because if they didn't, your choices would kill you much sooner. So think of disease more than a, a victim state, poor you, don't think of it that way. Think of disease as an expression of your genes screaming at you to make a change. The expression of your genes trying to give you symptoms to say, hey, look, do it differently because we can't keep adapting to your behaviors without you um, dying prematurely. So keep that in mind. Now, if you look at back at this diagram, you know there are chemical, emotional, spiritual, and physical inputs that you get to choose. Those inputs all affect each other. So your chemical input also affects you physically, and that also affects you emotionally, and vice versa. Your physical input affects you chemically, but also spiritually, and your spiritual input affects you chemically and physically. There's no separating. The problem in medicine today is the separation. Doctors put on 
these tunnel vision goggles. I'm a heart doctor only, right? If it's not your heart, I can't, I can't see beyond that. I'm a thyroid doctor only. If it's not your thyroid, I can't see beyond that. And that's one of the problems in specialty medi medicine is that um, your body is not one part. Your body is a sum of parts, and it's even more than that. It's not just the sum of your parts. It's so many other things. And so you have to have a holistic overview uh, uh, of how to view that. And if you don't, um, you're going to get into trouble. And so if you, if you look at each side affecting the other side and you look at the DNA, it reacts based on your choices and it expresses based on your choices, then you understand that you have a lot more power over the expression of your health than you are a victim, right? So keep that in mind as we move through. Okay, I'm gonna pause here because I've given you a lot to chew on and I really what I want you to be able to do is go back and review this information and think on it. And next week, we're gonna pick up with part two of this series. Katie has two questions. She wants to know, does gluten cause anemia and can it cause bone loss? So let's back up. Gluten, yes, it absolutely can cause anemia. One of the biggest forms of anemia we see is vitamin B12 deficiency, uh, which can cause a specific type of anemia called macrocytic anemia, which leads to shortness of breath, fatigue, brain fog, muscle aches and pains, and, uh, and just extreme, extreme fatigue. We also see iron deficiency anemia develop in a lot of people with gluten sensitivity because gluten disrupts the absorption of iron. And of course, iron is necessary to form the protein inside of your cells called hemoglobin, which is what carries oxygen to all the tissues of your body so that you can create energy. So two kinds of anemia, predominantly B12 and iron deficiency. Now on to part two of the question, can gluten cause bone loss? It absolutely can. Some research shows that the malnourishment and the malabsorption caused by gluten damage to the intestines leads to a bone loss caused, again, by nutritional deficits. So things like calcium and zinc and magnesium deficiency, copper, selenium, all these are minerals required for bone health and bone mineralization. When you have malabsorption from gut damage, you can develop bone loss in that way. Now there's some new research that shows that osteoporosis is also an autoimmune reaction and we believe that gluten is responsible in part for stimulating this autoimmune reaction against the proteins of bone themselves. So malnutrition and autoimmunity are both mechanisms by which gluten can induce bone loss. Thanks for asking your question, Katie. Tina writes in saying, where do I start? I'm already gluten free and have been that way for eight years. My, my gut never feels good and I'm at a complete loss. So the first thing I would say, Tina, if you're on a gluten free diet, you have to ask yourself, are you on a healthy gluten free diet? I'm gonna provide a resource below for you. Um, I want you to register, it's free for my master class on how to go gluten-free the right way. So many people do it and they continue to eat certain foods that mimic gluten, certain processed additives can mimic gluten, some medications that people are taking can damage their GI tract and keep them from recovering. And this class covers it all in very great detail. Again, I'm gonna put that link just below this video so that you can get free access to the Glutenology Masterclass. Thanks for writing in. Carrie wants to know, why do I still get stomach issues even though I'm gluten-free? A couple of things that you can try, Carrie. Number one, you may have more than just a gluten reaction. It's very good with gluten sensitivity also to be reactive to other foods. So you might consider getting with your doctor or a good functional medicine provider and asking them to test you for food reactivity, and it's very important, we're not talking about food allergy as much as we're talking about food sensitivity. They're very different things, 
and food sensitivities again very very common after getting off of gluten the other thing that you might consider is what else you're eating one of the other reasons people have persistent GI problems on a gluten-free diet is that they're picking all of the wrong foods the processed gluten-free products that contain corn and rice and xanthan gum and other fillers those things can mimic and behave like gluten creating gastrointestinal issues and so you might check your diet and make sure you're not getting those things now I'm going to put below this video a link to my master class where I go into depth about all of these things and it's free for you to watch you just have to register again that's it's called the glutenology master class and I think if you check that out you might find a more in-depth answer for why your GI issues are persisting even though you're gluten free Mila writes in with this question is it true that for someone who is not gluten sensitive that going on a gluten free diet will actually cause them to become gluten sensitive later answer no gluten sensitivity you either have it or you don't right and it's very much a genetic issue if you have the genes that predispose you to react to gluten and you consume gluten your your body will produce an inflammatory response against that gluten so stopping gluten and then reintroducing it won't make you more sensitive again you either have the genes or you don't if you want to learn more about the genetics of gluten sensitivity I'm going to put a link below this video that you can check out and learn all about gluten and genetics and gluten reactions thanks for asking your question Sandy writes in she wants to know why does gluten cause severe migraines and just general malaise um, when I eat it very simply put gluten is a neurotoxin there have been a number of research studies connecting gluten as a trigger to migraine headaches so if you've got migraines and you don't know why going gluten-free might just be a, a smart move for you to make now I'm gonna put a comprehensive article below on migraines and migraine triggers including gluten for you so that you can learn a little bit more about that and that connection between gluten and headaches thanks for sending your question in so Mika writes in and asks what's the best supplement to take if I'm having gluten withdrawal symptoms this is a great question many people going off of gluten can have almost like a withdrawal like a drug addiction like withdrawal reaction that can include headaches low-grade fever chills shakes irritability mood swings muscle cramps muscle spasms common symptoms of gluten withdrawal now if, if you're struggling in that regard some things that you can do to help support your body to offset that uh, two of my favorite number one is vitamin C at higher doses um, this is actually vitamin C is actually used in a lot of addiction clinics a lot of doctors will use high doses of vitamin C to help their patients overcome withdrawal symptoms so I like a good five grams of vitamin C for an adult now another nutrient that might be very helpful is vitamin B3 also used in many addiction clinics to help with withdrawal symptoms so vitamin C and vitamin B3 also referred to sometimes as niacin might be extremely helpful now one other thing that you might consider taking as well is just a really solid multivitamin many people going gluten-free are severely malnourished and so getting off that gluten um, well, along with those side effects and along with the gluten induced malnutrition just adding that multivitamin in can really help support the body's ability to heal and recover so good quality multi a good quality high dose vitamin C and a very good quality vitamin B3 those three would be the things I would say start with that it won't hurt you but it might very well help support you on your way I'm going to put some links to some of our favorite gluten free supplements below for you and you can go check those out Mara writes in with a pretty lengthy question she says I have celiac disease and have been totally gluten free and soy free for 12 years I get horrible peripheral neuropathy pain all over my arms and legs fairly consistently and doctors don't know why or what to do for me other than medicate me with gabapentin which I refuse is my peripheral neuropathy related to celiac disease well it's hard to say Mara there's a lot of there's a lot of things that go into the development of peripheral neuropathy certainly celiac disease and the malnutrition that comes with it can cause 
neuropathy. Um, that's very well studied. I've seen that clinically a number of times. Now that being said, you should ask your doctors if they haven't to check you for nutritional deficiencies because peripheral neuropathy is oftentimes a manifestation of B vitamin deficiency, particularly B12, B5, B1, and folate. So those four B vitamins are notorious for contributing to the neurological symptoms you know, associated with celiac disease. It's because celiac causes malnutrition. So you know, even though you've been gluten-free for years, you may have dug such a nutritional hole for yourself that your nerves need extra B vitamins in order to heal and repair. So ask your doctors to measure those nutrients and it's important to make sure that you ask them to measure intracellular, not serum levels, but intracellular levels. Serum levels give you false normals oftentimes. So you get the test and it shows everything looks good, but in actuality inside of your cells you don't have enough of those B vitamins. So ask for intracellular levels. The other thing that you might want to consider, there's two other very big things that I have seen cause persistent peripheral neuropathy in people after going off of gluten. Number one is other food reactions. If you haven't asked your doctors to measure those other food reactions, you could have some other food reactions that are contributing to nerve damage, so get those checked out. Number two, mold toxicity. I see this all the time in people who are in environmental mold. Their house has water damage or there's some type of mold internally, and so they are developing nerve damage as a result of exposure from mold toxins. And so, again, you can ask your doctor to measure you for mycotoxin levels. So you've got three pieces of homework there. B vitamins, ask your doctor to measure the intracellular. Other food reactions, ask to measure for food sensitivity, and then mold, ask your doctor to measure for mycotoxins. And those three things just might give you the answer that you've been missing for these last 12 years. Rihanna writes in and asks, why does digestion slow down during menopause and what can I do about it? So Renata, one of the things that's recently been discovered is that estrogen is very important for GI tract function. And so going through menopause, a lot of women's estrogen levels will drop. I don't know if you've had your estrogen levels measured. Might be a good idea that you visit your OB-GYN or other doctor and have those measured and see uh, just how low they actually are. There are certain uh, medicines that you can take like bioavailable or bioidentical estrogen uh, drugs which would have to be prescribed by your doctor but some people opt for some natural things that can interfere I shouldn't say interfere I should say interact with your estrogen receptors and so these are often referred to as adaptogens and some of the best estrogen adaptogens are things like Vitex Agnus Castus and Black Cohosh as a matter of fact we have a formula uh, called Women's Balance, and that formula is, um, is used in, in some of these situations to support digestion. Now, you might also consider that menopause has nothing to do with it, and that age, and the advanced age, is actually playing a role here. One of the things that happens in the GI tract as we age is there can be a slowdown of digestive enzyme and digestive acid secretion. And so you might have a problem with the quantity of, of enzymes and acid that you're producing to help digest your food. This can also slow down motility. So you might try supplementing with a digestive enzyme. You might try supplementing with something uh, like a digestive acid like betaine hydrochloride. Some people also take a couple of teaspoons of apple cider vinegar before a meal and see if that helps to improve their digestion and motility. So check those things out. Come back and let us know how they worked out for you. Man, um, although it'd be cool to meet a lot of the people that I would, would say are, are my idols in terms of knowledge and education, I don't know that I'd want to spend the day with any of them uh, for one simple reason. Sometimes when you read uh, somebody's works um, or enjoy somebody's art, um, you want to keep the knowledge of that person's personal life at a distance because um, it's almost in a sense a, a sense of romanticism that you can have from a, you can enjoy their gift 
from a distance without you know having to get to know them too personally i think getting to know sometimes people too personally can can uh, damper you know what you actually had built them up to be in your mind so i would say um, there's nobody i would probably really truly choose to do that with just simply because i wouldn't want to damper um, damper that pedestal that i've built them up on in my own mind Thanks for tuning in to the Dr. Osborne Zone. Don't forget to share, like, and subscribe for more content like this. And make sure you come back next Tuesday at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time and Thursday at noon 30 for more episodes.